morning or afternoon and welcome to the writing gals it is the last week in, of the month of february <laughs> and um so it's my last month or last sun call can i just like <laughs> <laughs> I'm super excited hey, because my kids are home yet again. I think it's like every podcast, <laughs> my kids have been home. And like we are had sleet and freezing rain. So anyways, my kids are home and my youngest was screaming and I totally just lost my train of thought. <laughs> last Thursday in February, which means it's my last time to moderate. So if you're tired of hearing me talk, you're in luck because next week, I think Laura gets to host her first. Yay! Yay. It's so exciting. But today we're going to talk about tropes. But before that, we're going to talk about what we're doing. So let's go to Victorine. What are you doing, Victorine? I am packing. Next week, I will be on a cruise. Sorry. Oh <laughs> so I won't be able to join you guys next week for Laura's first time moderating. But I'm so excited. It's a Star Trek cruise because Charles and I are nerds. And it set sail on Saturday. We're going to the Bahamas and the Virgin Islands. And I can't wait to get to be on the beach because it has been oh. snowing here nonstop this week. <laughs> so you know, I'm really ready. Here you talk, it makes me have faith that I there is life outside of five-year-olds and like seven-year-olds. Yes. And I'm very excited for when that time comes. So yes, we that all time will come. For you. So are you going to get so. words done on the boat? I am bringing my iPad and my little bridge keyboard thing. Um, so I will get words done. Probably not a lot on the boat because there's so much to do on the Star Trek cruise. There's always a show going on. The actors are all on board. Well, not all of them, but most, a lot of them are on board. And they're doing all kinds of shows, singing shows and just whatever, comedy, stuff like that. So we'll, we'll be going to shows and stuff like that. But in the airport and uh, all st places like that, I'll be writing. So I am working on still my um, angel story. I am 25,000 words into this story. And I'm like, I am not at the midpoint. So it's going to be a longer book than most of my books. Most of mine are 50,000 words. So this will be a little bit longer. But um, I'm also like thinking it might be a series. So Ooh. getting excited about doing that. So it's very exciting. Yeah. Oh man, go on a cruise. That's that's the life. <laughs> I'm just grateful that I have hot water and power and gas this time yes. around being stuck in my house. So, you know, I have I have smaller joys than Victorine does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Michelle, why don't you tell us what you're doing? This is very similar to what I'm doing. It is. <laughs> I also have ice outside and kids inside. Um, so I decided that since I probably wouldn't be able to write very well with my kids home, um, I decided to make them all clean their bedrooms. <laughs> oh, nice. I'm like getting rid of clothes, like to donate them and like cleaning all their junk out and making them all think that I'm the worst person ever. But they're also super excited, I think, to be seeing like their rooms look like they should. So, um, but I'm just right now still working on my um, Night Bloom Academy for Kindle Vela and working on my um, next rom-com that I'm super excited about um, and, you know, avoiding taxes and um, all the other business stuff that I should be doing because I can only manage a few things at a time and I can't do an ice storm and kids and not fun stuff like taxes at the same time. So, but next week I was just realizing Victoria says she won't be here. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, am I going to be here? I'm going to have to figure this out because I'm going to be traveling on the road all next week with my daughter. Who's got a choir, a big regional choir thing. Nice. And I get to stay in a hotel for four days by myself while she's off doing choir Ooh. stuff. So unlike Victorine, I will be able to get a lot of writing done next week. Nice. <laughs> so I just don't know what, where I'll be on Thursday. I might be in concerts on Thursday. We'll have to see. We, maybe we should move it to Wednesday next week or something. We'll talk. But you guys, just beware. Okay, that's it for me. Cool. Sounds amazing. I think cleaning rooms and junking sounds exactly, it actually sounds fun. So I wish I could, do <laughs> but can, I will not bring up the roads and the ice. I will just stay in my house <laughs> instead. All right, Laura, what about you? What are you up to? So me and my co-writer, Jesse Cal are, oh, we're about, I think coming up 
15,000 words in our sixth book in our fairy tale series. And we only started like at the beginning of the week. And it's just one of those when you're just living it. Like, I love it when you're writing and you don't see the screen, you don't feel your fingers, you're just living it. And it's just sort of happening. Oh, so I'm there at the moment. And um, I'm also writing a second chance (laughs) rom-com, which is a bit different to the fantasy. But yeah, doing that, my new release is chugging along. Um, I was really excited because I got reviews coming in for people who'd actually been like either a parent of someone on the autism spectrum or they are on the autism spectrum and they were just really happy to have that representation and they were happy to have something that was authentic. So I was like, oh, okay, feel good, feel happy about that. Um, and I'm still going on with my TikTok challenge. Um, haven't run any ads. I feel like a like a I'm in an AA meeting because so I'm like it's been 25 days since I ran an ad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like so I want to run ads, but it's really cool to see how far I can go and what I can achieve without doing ads. And it's opened my mind to there are other ways to market your books. It doesn't have to just be put your money into the, you know, Facebook machine or whatever. So I'm excited about that. But I'm also excited to have this month draw to a close. So next month I can start doing ads and TikTok. So that'll be fun. Sounds amazing. I want to get back to the point where I can write a book and feel that way that you feel about it. You know, like I don't think I've been, haven't written a book in a long time where I felt that way. So it's I'm very, very jealous of it. Oh. But anyways, sounds amazing. Cool. And I, we're excited to hear your ending. Where are you at right now? Income wise. Do you want to say? I am. Um, oh, I didn't. Did I send you a screenshot this morning? I can't remember. I think I'm at 3,600. And with my wide sales and my audio, that's another 250. So I'm like, I can see 5,000 like on the horizon. <laughs> I'm like, what, what? I just need something to go viral. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think and it's all amazing. profit. Yeah, it's all profit. Yeah. That's oh, well, amazing. I spent like $80 on a cover and like I have some editing fees coming in, but it's like not a lot. I think I spent like $60 because it was a short story. So, yeah, most of it's profit. Sorry, I'm, like, so transparent. Like, I don't want anyone to believe. I'm like, oh, yes, 100% profit. <laughs> but most that's that awesome. Is- that you haven't released yet. So that's kind of a different category. It's kind of, like, over here. Not, like, oh, yeah, on what you have. True. Yes, this mm-hmm. is true. So it has, is yeah. not available there to actually earn you anything back as yeah. of yet. That's true. Yeah. 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 And if I, if I included all the pre-orders I got this month, then I have made 5,000 this month. Nice. That's fantastic. Yeah. And you said some of your pre-orders you got from TikTok videos. Yeah, yeah. Like I made the stupid, well, maybe not. Maybe it was genius, but it felt it stupid at the time. I was like, hey, what if uh, the Little Mermaid was engaged to the prince, but she was in love with Captain Hook? And everybody went nuts. They were like, I have to read this book. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's not out yet. yeah we got like 109 pre-orders or something silly so yeah I was (laughs) it's funny it's a good platform to test as well story ideas like if you haven't written a story or you're just thinking about putting up a pre-order try it out on TikTok and if it really takes off you're like okay I might have to read the book write the book then read the book <laughs> well that's so true because i see all these people like i saw an audiobook artist once who was like imagine this and then she goes through the scenario and literally her comments were like where is this book i want this yeah. book and she's like i well somebody write it because i didn't <laughs> write it i just thought it was a good scene so, <laughs> definitely very cool well awesome and i am trying to write but i am going through existential crises like every day now which is exciting <laughs> but um trying to figure out, you know, trying to remind myself that Q1 was supposed to be about focusing on my backlist, getting things set up. I'm losing my hair and I have psoriasis. And so the psoriasis around my eyes is super bad right now because I'm so stressed out. (laughs) But hopefully I will get over this hump and and, um, uh, move forward. So I'm just trying to figure out where I'm going to be and, and have a good launching off point. So when I actually start writing more, um, I will, I, I just, 
putting out books when you're not selling your current books is very demoralizing. And so I'm just like, okay, focus on setting a base income for yourself. When you have 57 books, you kind of like, all right, I have enough product out there. I just need to figure out how to sell it. To, so doing TikToks and trying to figure Facebook. And yesterday I spent the entire day on Amazon ads. So, and the day before that, again, another time I spent all on Amazon ads. So slowly learning things. Um, but planning and thinking, I have started, I, I like to collect covers. So I have yeah. started a new cover. I ordered a new cover for a new series slash genre I want to write because it just sounded fun to do. Um, but yeah, it's just, I'm kind of all over the place right now. But you know what? I think that you can go through those when you're in, when you get to certain levels and you get to certain, you know, points on your journey, you kind of have to sit back and say, what, what's going to be my best, like, way forward and i only have one book on pre-order which i's never i always have a million books on pre-order so i'm just trying to be nice kind to myself and trying to focus on getting the headspace and i think laura you said you want to talk about that next week or next month it was about mindset right am i wrong yeah okay well i was personally focusing on mindset next month oh so I I we're gonna do rom-com next month oh rom -com. i'm sure mindset will come into it because Writing comedy is a mind game, <laughs> so I'm sure it'll come into it. I'm like getting cool. nodding heads. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, and then for me, like it was, it was like okay, I get the concept of mindset. Like I get like, say, how do you turn? Like if you guys were in the writing gals, you saw my post about how there's some things you can control and you can't control, and how to like realize when you had like Amazon luck touch your book and be grateful for that, but don't try to re replicate it because then you'll go crazy. Um, and then you lose your train of thought. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> uh, well, basically just, oh, here we go. Oh, okay. Now I remember. And so like, you're like, okay, turn a positive into a negative or a negative, a positive, into a, negative <laughs> a negative into a positive. And then I'm like, okay, but then what? Like I can think good things. Things, but then how does that change anything around me? So I had a little like one-on-one -on -one therapy session with Kelsey Stetling today where she kind of, she's a huge mindset guru. And so she was helping me figure out like what the next steps are. So it was very interesting. So that's kind of like my goal. I got to get a good headspace, a good place in my life. And then I really just feel like my blo I'm blocked writing wise just because of all this other stuff going on. And then being okay with that, being like, you know, I think we feel like, oh, if I don't write today, then I'm not worthy. I will spend 10 hours doing business stuff, but not feel good about myself because I didn't put any words on paper. So trying to get out of that, that mindset too. So anyways, yeah. let's talk about tropes and universal fantasies because I love these. So let's start out with what is a trope? A trip is a building block. That's how I we we've you've heard to it that way a lot. Um, it's all the different pieces that you put into a story, um, that are predictable and common and like universal. So like, it's something that lots of people will recognize and even look forward to being in a story. So I'm not talking about like main characters and climaxes. I'm talking about things like character tropes would be like enemies to lovers or scene tropes would be like an inn or a small town. Um, you could have um, scene tropes like um, there's only one bed at the hotel and they both have to share the room. So there's a lot of different kinds of tropes. Some people get tropes and cliches confused. Just because it's a trope doesn't mean it's cliche. If it's a cliche, it's probably a trope. <laughs> so the tricky thing is, is to use tropes in a way that's not cliche which is yes. totally possible. So that's mm -hmm. why people get have that confusion because they think that just because something's done over and over and over again, that it's a cliche when actually everything is done. Like you cannot, you cannot invent something new. Mm -hmm. uh, it, like it's just impossible. Basically we're all working with the same Lego sets and we're just trying to put them together in creative ways. And it's when you build the same castle over and over and over and over again, that looks exactly the same. That's when it starts to be like, I've seen this before, right? So that's why we all need to know what tropes are so we can use them and understand them. Um, and also the hard part is learning how to use them in ways that is fresh and exciting. I like to think of it too, as if you're gonna describe a movie to somebody 
You normally don't go like you're trying to convince them to watch the movie. You don't normally go into like heavy detail about the character, the character past, all those things. You normally like say, well, it's an enemies to lovers story. And right away, that person will say, okay, I know what that means. Like, what does that, that, what that entails sort of thing. So, um, yeah, Diana, Diana said tropes are common plot devices within a genre and they do vary from genre to genre. Um, Mm -hmm. especially like inside of like enemies to lovers have a lot of the same types of plot points, but they can be different in a fantasy versus a rom-com versus a sci-fi. What about you, Victorine or Lord? Do you have anything you want to add? Well, um, Dinah said it perfectly that I, I was going to say it was a common plot device and, and she took that. So <laughs> good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just a, just a plot device that you see all the time that people use in order to create a, a unique story by putting in unique characters in these situations. And Victorine put together a very fabulous list of role excuse me, romance tropes that's up on our website. So if you guys want to check those out, it was really helpful. Um, it's something that I use. So how do you use tropes, excuse me, within your within your writing? Victorine or Laura, you want to go first? I like to use tropes. I like to kind of look over the list of tropes just to get ideas, story ideas, because um, a lot of times you kind of start there with your story, like, okay, my characters hate each other. Well, that's enemies to lovers if you're writing romance um and and so i kind of start with the tropes and then build my story from there thinking about okay um what can i put in to make it cool what's my setting going to be what um and a lot of times the tropes are what gives you the main conflict between your characters especially in romance um and so that's one thing that i go to is to look at that for all my conflict Perfect. Laura, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so um, now I start with tropes when I'm looking at writing a book or when I want to write a book. And um, I think it's useful to do it that way around because before I would write the book and then I would go back and go, oh, what tropes are in my book? Because tropes are helpful for keywords. So when you go into your KDP and you get like seven keywords you could put in, you can put tropes in there and that can really help find the readers who are looking for your story. Um, And also I I kind of use it for characterization. So for one of my books, um, How to Nanny a Billionaire's Baby, it was going to be an opposites attract uh, trope. And I was like, right, okay, they need to be opposites. But I needed to do it in a way that was meaningful and authentic. Like I'm, I know we're all different types of writers, but I'm really character driven in my writing. So I was like, I really want strong characters. And they not just be that, you know, he's introverted and she's extroverted. Like, I want to get lower than that. So I actually use something called the Myers-Briggs personality test profiles. So if you go online, look it up, there's like 16 personality types. And you can actually find really in-depth profiles of every personality and also how they interact with each personality on there and it's amazing like they interact at work or how they are with family or how they are in relationships um so for tropes for me are like the key to opening that book and just like starting the journey and making sure because you can be a pantser you don't have to plot a book that's to, to to write a good book but if you do begin with a few things to start like tropes um and get your characters right you kind of can't go wrong then it keeps you on the right path um so yeah i find them really, like they're like the bread and butter of writing a book for me <laughs> tropes i like to use tropes um not only to understand like what my characters um are going to be doing in the story and what their relationships with each other are going to be, but what conflicts are inherent within those tropes. So, um, and sometimes I mix several tropes together so that I can create better conflict. Like when I was trying to come up with the tropes for my rom-com, A Man We're Shaving For, I knew that I wanted it to be like, um, you know, this sort of like, office romance which is a trope and I wanted it to be um you know when we're he's got like it wasn't really boss employee but it was sort of like he has power over her job and her future at the company and 
So it's that like imbalance of power sort of thing. But I was like, but none of that is funny. Like, what, what can I do that would make this funny? And so I was looking at the tropes and I saw fish out of water. And I thought, okay, well, how can I make him a fish out of water in an office romance? And I was like, what if it's a company run by women for women where it's all lingerie? And he's really, I was like, but some guys might just really, really like that, right? So then I really dove digger, like deeper into the fish out of water thing. And I mean, I made him a virgin. <laughs> So like he had n with like no sisters or anything like so he had no experience with women's underwear or lingerie or any of that because like the more experienced man might like take it in his stride right so I had to create something that made it like a very out of his comfort zone situation for him so that it was dynamic and funny in that way I had one reviewer ask me why I brought that up that he was and I was like well that's why because like, I wanted you to know why it was uncomfortable for him to show up at, you know, in the conference room and be surrounded by racks of sexy lingerie and bras and panties and have women holding them up to, you know, check them. And, you know, like, that's why. So you just do that. Like, look at the tropes and be like, what am I trying to accomplish with this story? Where do I want to go? And what tropes will take me there? And that's when you, once you've decided <coughs> on the tropes, even you just have to kind of keep digging because they're they're pretty basic until you figure out what you want to do with them once you figure out how you're going to color them um i also watch dramas a lot and take my favorite scenes and they're the scenes that happen over and over and over again because people like them so much so there's always like him holding the umbrella over her in the rain for example is a very common trope in you know a lot of especially asian dramas but just a lot of shows and I write them down. I actually sit down when I'm writing, watching, and I write down things that occur to me like, oh, I really like that. Or I see that all the time. Why do I see that all the time? And so when I'm writing or pantsing my idea for the story, I create those candy bar scenes with those scene tropes that I really, really like. And those kind of lay out sort of a path for me to follow of things I really want to happen in my story and how they affect the particular um matchup of character shops I've decided on. That's perfect. And I think there's also major tropes and minor tropes. So um, where you will have like billionaire mm -hmm. as a trope, but that in of itself is not enough, but it says enough under, like if you said, I'm writing a story about a billionaire, most of the time you're going to kind of assume what the girl is going to be or the relationship between the male character and the female character and then you start to add things in like fish out of water um unrequited unrequited love um you could second do chance. romance second chance there's lots you can add into that where billionaire is the major trope and the other ones like you couldn't really have i mean you could have unrequited unrequited love but that you would do like best friends to lovers and then have unrequited romance i'm not sure if i'm saying that word right but underneath that. So there's major ones and then there are minor ones. Um, so somebody's asking, are there some tropes specific to comedic content, like rom-com scene tropes? Um, I think if you, if you watch romantic comedies or read a lot of rom-coms, you will start seeing some things that are really common, like the heroine really embarrassing herself um, in places or... Um, to people um, making really gross or like strong um, jumping, like jumping to conclusions and making wrong conclusions about things, right? Um, you're gonna see that they have mistaken, they, they mistake somebody's identity, it's a lot. So they think somebody is the girl their boyfriend's been cheating with and then it's really not, it's, the new CEO of her company or something like that. You know, it's just like anything that puts your character in trouble is a good trope for romantic comedy. That's what I would just say. Like not all tropes put your character in trouble at all. It's, it's all the things that put your character in a place. None of us want to be, <laughs> especially if it gives the reader secondhand embarrassment. Those are good rom-com tropes. Well, and I think too, you ought to be careful with the way you approach tropes. 
So they're very specific in the way you do them. So a billionaire trope, the guy it has to be the rich one. If you're doing a romance, it just it has to be that way. That if you try to flip it on its head, you're going to get you you'll have diehard readers for that, but it will not appeal to a mass group of people. And I think tropes appeal to a mass group of people. So like in a rom-com, you're talking about tropes make sure that they are the girl is the ditzy or the the one that always is having problems the guy has to be the you know kind of grounded more maybe more serious i think personally and you guys can tell me wrong if i'm wrong or not but to me that's it's normally very, how a rom-com goes it's very common that way yeah obviously you can twist that and that was something i wanted to talk about like with all of these tropes it gets interesting when you start twisting expectations right um, mm -hmm. So you have to understand how to use them like in a straightforward way first and then know how to twist them slightly to give them like, you know, some surprise and elements of, you know, newness. Well, and you could uh, make your guy the really ditzy, clumsy one if you wanted to twist sort of the expectations in a rom-com. Yeah, you can, you can do it. I'm just saying if you're going to yeah. want to appeal to a broader, like uh, Dinah says, what about the movie Overboard? It's a fish out. I think like it's a fish out of water scenario because she is coming into his life either way. So if he was a billionaire, she would have to be a poor girl coming into a rich guy's life or he's a poor guy and she's a rich girl coming into a poor guy's life. It's that dichotomy between the two of them. Yeah. I think that is more the stronger trope in overboard rather than the billionaire type trope. I think it's more, um, social class distant distance and social class rather than because because i think the billionaire trope there's specific things for that trope that's different than just a really rich person right um so when you're talking um with the female super rich you could totally do that like the bodyguard movie and and um stuff like that but um it's not really the billionaire trope people are watching it for it's more the the other tropes and I think that one of the main tropes as well of rom-com is to be unapologetically yourself and have someone love you for it. That's something that I think a lot of people find really endearing and like attracts them to that genre because we all feel a little bit like a hot mess. So we relate. That's, that's why often the female is a bit clumsy because even though it's more exaggerated than how we are in real life, we don't necessarily always trip up and, you know, do something silly. It, um, we can relate to it a bit more. And when they find true love, we're like, oh, maybe we can show my boyfriend my crazy quirks and he'll love me too. <laughs> love that. Um, she said her being a billionaire was a twist at the end. We assumed most of the story that it was her husband's money. Interesting. Very. Yeah. I love this. So this is one of the things that we're going to, well, I wanted to talk about was how can we, how do you know what tropes are selling? So the big thing, you know, okay. So you decided you want to write a book and you're kind of figuring out what you want to write. You have sort of an idea. How do you put together something that is easy to pitch that has a easy elevator pitch? How do you go and see what's selling? Because that's the bigger thing. We're always like, research the market. Okay, well, how do you research the market? Um, I think you can look um, very easily at the top bestsellers list on Amazon. They have one for every category, just about. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little, like, it's not completely straightforward all the time because there's always going to be some books in there that don't belong in that category. So you have to be really careful. Um, and you also kind of have to pay attention to it regularly. You can't just go on there and do like a one day browse and say, oh, well, this is what I'm going to bank the whole rest of my year on this one day on the best list. Because it changes a lot. Um, but also you, you can have books like um, have a promotion going that, you know, rise up really high and not necessarily reflective of what the audience mostly wants. So just keep an eye on it and see what, generally is trending on the tops of the list. And then another thing you can do besides that is understand how well that category sells in general on Amazon, because the top three or four books might be doing really well. And like, if it's not a big category, then, you know, the last 75 books on the list might actually not be selling any books or not very many books because it's a small category. So you just have to learn all the different dynamics of the bestsellers list by familiarizing yourself with them. 
um, it always helps to look at the read through page, um, the read through um, sample for the book. So you can kind of see things like what point of view they're being written in, um, what tense they're being written in, um, just like different kinds of things like that. Pay attention to the covers because covers reflect not just, you know, cover trends, but they reflect tropes a lot. Um, you can see a lot of tropes in the titles, but sometimes the titles aren't super great with showing the tropes and the covers can give you more information on that, um, as well as the subtitles and read the blurb. And then uh, I'm just talking. And then under the blurb, you can see all the words that Amazon pulls out that are common in the reviews. And those are a treasure trove of, um, you know, what people are liking and not liking as far as tropes go within a story. And awesome. you can also get the reports from um, Kalytics, which are packed full of what tropes are doing really well. You can also see what's doing well on Netflix and mm -hmm. um, what is doing well on any of social media, like um, not just like books that are selling, but books that have buzz and movies that have buzz and series that have buzz, um, you know, like Bridgerton was a book series and very popular for a long time. And then when it came out on Netflix, it had a resurgence because it found a whole new audience from Netflix. And because of that, Regency as a whole has had a resurgence. Yeah, it has. So don't just pay attention to books. I think as well, a lot of those tactics are particularly good if you're a fast writer. Uh, sometimes trends come in, like these tropes become a trend and then they like, they're gone before, before you even get the book out. So one thing I like to do is go on Bookstagram or BookTok or go into reader groups and kind of just watch what is everyone talking about, what the reader's saying. Oh, my goodness, if I read a Hades and Persephone retelling, I just like one click buy it now. And I find loads of people are talking about it. I'm like, OK, my next book is going to be <laughs> about that then. <laughs> um, and you can usually see like over a longer period of time, like, which are the tropes that are coming up again and again and again, like enemies to lovers, billionaire, like there's so many ones that are a little bit more safe. So if you like, if you write only one book a year or so, I would probably, I would err on the side of caution because if you go for something that's super niche, you might find that like by the time you get it out, everyone's like, Ugh, so done with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, go with a reader. I think Right. And, and, and that's what I'm going to kind of piggyback off of you. I think looking at people's reviews. So looking at books that you kind of want to write, read what reviews are saying, read what they're saying they loved and read what they say. They say the uh, author maybe had failed a little bit at um, because tropes are such a huge expectation that if you don't do it right or you don't do it wrong, but do it intentionally wrong or just in slightly it. off. Yeah you can really upset your readers and they're going to let you know through your reviews. Um, the other thing I think is so important is to be on bookstagram, um, be on book talk because people talk about things that I like didn't know. TikTok is huge about grumpy sunshine. And I don't even remember, I don't even know if that's on your trope list, Victorine, but that is such a huge trope. And not only is it a way for you to signal to your reader that he's grumpy and she's sunshine, like, You'll read this like it does, uh, that's all you have to say. <laughs> and your reader will then be like, oh, okay, I want to read this. So that's I, like as I'm planning my next book, I'm like, okay, well, how can I make him grumpy in her sunshine if it fits with the story? Um, so reading or hearing, listening to what readers are saying, um, oops, that they want um will help you as you plot or look for tropes that may be trending. Um so, or ways that you could pitch where if you're like, well, I have a book that's grumpy sunshine. You're like, wow. Okay. Now I just came up with a way to pitch my book to a reader or put that keyword in my blurb or put my keyword in that seven keyword list on Amazon. Um, that will really pull the, that reader in. Um, so, okay. We talk about, we talked about tropes, but tropes are just billionaire there's things inside of it that make uh exciting so I, I was telling these ladies i was like i'm gonna ask you what's your like come with your favorite trope and then like pitch it to us like why is it your favorite trope what is it about the storyline or what happens inside the trope that makes it your favorite trope so let's start with victorine 
My favorite trope is fake relationship. You probably all already know that if you've read any of my books, because I have, I like do it over and over and over again. <laughs> um, I love that one probably because it forces two people together um, and they have to act like they like each other, even if they hate each other. <laughs> it creates tons of tension. Um, you can have a, a ton of fun with it because the, you can throw them in situations where they're like, ah, all of a sudden we have to act like this in front of the camera or whatever. Um, so that's probably my favorite one. So like what is specific moments are your favorite to write? Is it like when his, when they're faking that they're holding hands and his fingers linger a little bit longer? Like what are the, what are the parts inside that trope that this, so this is, we're basically talking about universal fantasies inside of tropes. So like, what is it the part of that trope that you're just like, Oh, I love it when this happens. I love when they um, have to physically show affection to each other when they're not there yet um, emotionally. It forces them to um, just have a different kind of relationship. You know, even if it's a fake kiss for the camera, it just changes their relationship. And and it seems like during the, the forced relationship, their relationship just changes over and over and over again, as you, as you force them into these situations and then, then they're alone and they're like, they can let it all go, you know, and, and get real with each other. And, and you can find out how they really feel about each other. So I don't know. I just love that. It's perfect. Thank you. Cool. All right, Laura, what about you? What's your favorite trope? And mine like, is grumpy sunshine. <laughs> so I'm going to explain because in the, in the comments, they're like, what is grumpy sunshine? Grumpy Sunshine is when one character is like the dark, brooding, moody person. And then the other character is just like this ray of sunshine and positivity. And I wrote this pairing. So the next two books I'm writing is actually this uh, trope. I didn't realize it till we, we were talking about it. And um, my book, uh, How to Nanny a Billionaire's Baby, she is um, she's like a crystal loving free spirited California girl that loves to walk around barefoot on the beach. And she just lets her hair free and she just takes life as it comes. She's just this amazing ball of energy and love. And even though everything that could go wrong goes wrong for her, but she always finds a way to look at the bright side and be like, well, the sun is shining and you know, well, I've found this opportunity to help this person and everyone around her is grumpy. <laughs> she's happy. And the billionaire is really grumpy, well, more like depressed because his brother died and he has to take custody of his niece, his baby niece. And he's come from England and obviously he's grieving. So it has this very serious element to it. But as the two get together and she becomes his nanny, her positive bundle of joy kind of rubs off on him and slowly it starts to help him kind of refined joy in life again and I love that dynamic because it's kind of like I also like opposites attract I just kind of like the tension and the, the way you get an awful lot of character growth because not only is it about transforming the person who is grumpy into someone who's more positive it actually was also grounding the person who is pretty much like too positive like their head was in the clouds they weren't taking anything seriously and so you have this amazing dynamic between the two where they they learn something from each other and then by the end of the book it's like you don't know who is who they're like the same person ah oh, i just love that trope <laughs> sounds awesome I'm excited. I want to really focus on writing a good, uh, really intentional grumpy sunshine in the next book I'm writing. All right, Michelle, what about you? Okay. So my favorite trope is the reluctant lover. And I don't know that I've like seen that spelled out many places, but I really, really like it when the guy resists and resists and resists and resists falling in love with the girl. But then once he does, he's all in. Like, it's just sudden, and then, like, nothing can keep him from absolutely adoring this woman. Um, so I especially like it combined with, like, the trope that he loved her first. So, like, if you combine the reluctant lover with he loved her first trope, that's, that's hands down. It doesn't matter what other trope. I have seen it. people on Book Talk talk exactly about what you're saying. Like I yeah. wrote it down in my list of tropes. Stuff. Exactly what you're saying. That is right. This 
That is my favorite. And like, it doesn't matter what you mix it up with, with other tropes. That, that has to be my, I think that's probably, probably every story I've ever written is probably right there. So like, yeah, he can't ease into love with her. He has to fight it and fight it and fight it until finally he just can't hold back and then he's all in 100%. So yeah. what would you add that with? Because what would ask me? It could be any of my books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think because I'm like he falls first and he falls. He's reluctant and then falls hard. So she. Well, so like it's usually combined. Like what she will have her own conflict why she can't be in love with him for whatever reason. So it works really good with bad boy tropes. Um, it works really well with. Um, it works really well with billionaire tropes. Um, I've, I've done that too. Like a lot of times, like if she's his assistant, for example, she will not fall in love with him because he's her boss and he just won't fall in love with her for like whatever reason you give him. Maybe it's because he's, she's his employee. Maybe it's because he's been burned by love. Maybe it's because she's just like someone else he loved and lost. I mean, you can come up with whatever reason you want, but it just like, I just want to see the guy like, digging his heels in and fighting it as much as he possibly can. And then she's just so perfect and like everything he wants. And when he finally acknowledges it, he's just like, fine, I will love you till the end of time and no one will ever compare to you. And I will pr protect you with every fiber of my being. And it's just like, you can just see that, like that moment you asked what our favorite part was. It's that switch, that moment of clarity for him when he finally has to acknowledge the depth of his feelings for her. And then he's just like, well, now that I've decided this, no holding back. That's just like, oh. like which one, who, who, what woman doesn't want that to happen for a guy to just all of a sudden be all in on her. None of this half-hearted easing into love. I like you a little bit more today than I did yesterday. No, it's like, <laughs> it's so interesting now i'm gonna have to look into some books that like that because i get, yeah, I I get it. it in theory but i don't get it in practicality do you, you have to do it through his that. pov huh can, do you have to do it through his pov too like can you have that with just all her pov yeah you can it's harder this is the thing i like about having um like single pov books is that the man is so much more of a mystery, right? Right. So like you as an author know when he makes that switch and you can give the reader a clue as to when that switch happens, right? Um, but like the reader's going to be watching for it. I, wa I watch for it in dramas. I watch for that moment when you realize not only does he like her, because you see clues that he likes her before then, but the moment he realizes he likes her or he acknowledges that he likes her to himself, it changes the way he talks to her, the way he interacts with her, the way he goes to bat for her, the way he protects her. There's, there's such a shift that it doesn't have to be in his point of view where he's telling you straight out. I mean, that's great too. Um, but you can do it without his point of view, just simply like showing how he's different towards her you know and I love it I love it when she doesn't notice but everybody around him notices like you know like when his best friend notices when his you know ex-girlfriend notices the other woman notices his mother notices like when <laughs> other people in his circle they're like wait a second and everybody knows that he's completely crazy about her and she hasn't figured it out yet so that's just like some of the things that like go hand in hand with that. Interesting. Okay. Somebody asked, is, is that like, what's wrong with secretary Kim? Mm, I think so. Yes. There is a definite switch for him too. In that one, when he figures out he likes her. I don't, I don't know that that's a, she, he loved her first one though. I'll have to, I might have to go watch it again and see, but um, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying I to think, think he that. did love her first. He just didn't realize what it was because she was like, yeah. okay, I'm leaving. And he's like freaking out over yeah. it. <laughs> but I think she knew she liked him. Didn't she know she liked him? And that's why she was quitting? I don't uh, remember. Watch it again. It's been a okay. long time. Dolly and the Cocky Prince, which we have talked about a lot on this. 
um, is what you get when he loves her first. Like, it is yes. so obvious in that show that he loved her before she loved him. But there wasn't that reluctant to love her thing in that dynamic. Yeah. You're right? right? So, like, it's it's too, it's, they're not always mutually, like, combined together. I just love it the most when they're combined together. So it's like Pride and Prejudice that then? Like someone said here asked Pride and Prejudice, Darcy's point of view, but wouldn't Pride and Prejudice because he falls for her first and uh, is right he? into it because he told her, despite my better like thought, I'm going, I want to marry you. And she's like, what? I think he, yeah, I think he acknowledged it before she did for sure. But she was in love with him before he confessed to her. She just didn't acknowledge it yet. Oh, okay. She was in denial. She was in denial. <laughs> That's interesting. I'll have to think. I'll have to, I'm, I'm, I'll have to, I'll have to actually well, watch. We should do a workshop. We should like bring all these stories together. Yeah. So there was a Kindovella question. Did you see it, Michelle? About yeah. The, the way did, someone what, wanted like, to know about it. How do you see it. what's doing well in Kindovella? Um, yeah. So the best way to tell is to watch the top fave list because they don't have a bestsellers list. They do have a trending list so you can cast your eyeballs on the trending list too but it's smaller so i would say top fave list and trending list um the tricky thing is is that it's everything all mixed in together right so another way that makes it easier to really drill down into um sort of a category or a trope because everything is tagged on Vela by tropes is to search for a trope you can actually click on a story that you know has that trope has that tag so like um my young adult one will have like enemies to lovers on it you can click on the enemies to lovers tag and it'll take you to a separate list of every book on kindle that has the enemies to lovers tag and we don't know exactly how they rate what books are at the top of that list because some books rank higher on the top fave list than they do on the category list or the tag lists. But if it's at the top of the tag list, you know it's doing well in some respects. And if it has a crown and it's at the top of the list, then you know it's the most popular or one of the most popular books in that trip on Kindle Bella. Um, the number of books on the list that has a crown on it tells you how well that trope is doing overall in the store so like if you go to um best friends to lovers and you click on it and there's only one story that's crowned then that's only one story out of 250 of the top favorites on vela that are best friends to lovers so you're like uh eh, not so much but then if you go and you click on um oh, give me another one like cowboys right? And you click on Cowboys and there's 35 books that have crowns. Then you know that cowboy romances or cowboy books are doing really well on the top fave list in Kindle Bella. So that's kind of how you would go about like searching what's doing well in the overall store um, and by specific categories. Cool. And then for me, I would say my favorite trope is probably enemies to lovers. And I think it's kind of that um, I love it when he knows how to irritate her. and But he does it in a flirty way. And so he like knows how to push her buttons and just like smirks while she just kind of like loses her mind over it because she's so it's kind of that he falls first. Like I like it when he has feelings for her, but doesn't want to acknowledge them or show her that he has those feelings. So he wants to flirt with her, but he still wants to have that. It's very much like my husband's and my relationships where, you know, <laughs> like the little boy who likes a girl. So he like pulls her pigtails type of thing, you know, cause he just doesn't want her to know it and uh, that he likes her. And, and then of course I love the scene where if they're fighting and she's just getting all riled up and then he just grabs her and just kisses her. Cause that's just like, it's the tension between the two of them have mounted. Neither of them are willing to acknowledge that they have feelings for the other person. Um, and they just, they just kiss and then everything changes. That's, that's really fun. But I really love the teasing 
the back and forth. You know, he just really knows how to get her goat. But then when it's time to get serious, he's very serious and protective over her or he will listen or he'll be that shoulder to cry on, which totally startles her. because She doesn't know, like, wait a minute. He's not this like mean, grumpy beast that I don't like. He's actually kind and he's kind to me. Um, so I, I, I love enemies to lovers. It's one of my favorite. Um, Jeff, did you want to say something? Oh, I was going to say the enemies to lovers and the reluctant lover play really well together um, in general, because especially if he's somebody that everybody knows is not like usually affectionate towards somebody or doesn't usually show a whole lot of care or protection for other people. And then all of a sudden he does for this one person. That's what lets the reader know, even without words, that they are, you know, having feelings for that person. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, how you play that. We were just, I was just going to bring it back and he kind of like tacked back into the conversation we were having before. Well, yeah. And I think because you can do enemy lovers, enemies to lovers, grumpy sunshine, because um, inherit, inherit into those two, you can add, or you could do enemies to lovers, reluctant lover. Um, that's another one. Yeah. Oh, and that's like best friends to lovers. You can do he falls first, she falls first, or neither of them or neither of them have feelings and then they fall together. And yeah. so there's, there's multiple ways that you can play these different tropes. Yeah. And it's those. So Jesse asked, what's the difference between tropes and universal fantasy? It really is going to vary to person to person you talk to. For me personally, tropes are more like the overarching thing. And universities, university, universal fantasies are what make the trope a trope. So it's all the little little bits and pieces that you put inside of a story that make a trope what it is and makes it an enemies to lovers trope. I think that's a really good way to, to differentiate it. Yeah, or you might describe it like um, the trope is the device itself and the universal fantasy is why it works, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So like the universal fantasy could like be boiled down and expressed in a couple different tropes, right? But the trope works because of the universal fantasy that it satisfies. Yeah, well, like, for example, like, oh, go ahead, Laura. Sorry, well, I think also just a slightly different take on it. It's an experience that universally most women want to experience. So like mm -hmm. if we think of Disney, for example, the idea that animals come and clean your house for you, that's like a real universal fantasy, at least for me, <laughs> like everyone I know. And the idea of um, like um, Cinderella having a fairy godmother come and just like make her a dress and get her off to the ball and and that kind of also Cinderella is actually full of them because she goes to the ball and everybody looks at her so it's the idea of she gets all this attention and everybody thinks she's the most beautiful one in the room and um yeah I think it's 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 like the the feelings and experiences that we don't necessarily have in real life but we would love to have that's the stuff in the books that we're like and it's also, I think the universal fantasy is is the thing that can make your book stack up better than other books that are writing in the same kind of trope. So you can have loads of enemies to lovers, but if you've got universal fantasies in there that are really ticking those boxes, your book is going to perform better than the others. I think like an overarching universal fantasy for romance is for a woman to feel adored and treasured by this man that everybody else wants. Right. And so like all of the kind of tropes that feed into that are ways that men show women being adored. Right. So like a common scene trope in a lot of dramas I watch, like I mentioned the umbrella where holding it over her in the rain because he wants to protect her from the rain or if she's wet and cold, he needs to get her changed warm and dry. Or if she's been hurt, he needs to give her first aid. Um, if there's only one bed, he will sleep on the floor. If, you know, if there's a cr crowd in the elevator, he will shield her from everybody else so that she's not being, you know, pushed around. So all, all of those like individual tropes are things that we all see all the time in dramas. And they all feed into this universal fantasy of he adores and treasures this woman and will do anything to protect and shield and lavish her with affection and so like that is kind of like how you, that's what I was trying to kind of get to earlier is all of those tropes all those different scene tropes work because they feed into every woman's fantasy of being treated that way by a man mm -hmm. 
I was going to say something like Beauty and the Beast would be, you know, being taken from your normal everyday life and going to a castle and having the the richest man in the area uh, want you there. And then you get, you know, doted upon and you don't have to have your kids screaming at you. And he falls in love with you and he protects you against beast. You know, you know, he protects Belle against the wolves. It protects you against people that, you know, or things that could hurt you um, on a regular basis, like all of that. And, and it's more like the brooding guy who nobody can get to, but you're the only one that can like break through that icy exterior and like really like change his heart is such a, is such a fantasy um, yeah. inside of just that universal fantasy of beauty and the beast, you know, you know, poor kind of you know, regular girl who changes this, you know, like you could probably say like Pride and Prejudice is a lot like Beauty and the Beast in that, in that sense. It's that feeling you get when you, you like, oh, that story, like, ooh, that sounds exciting. Um, I, wanna, I think, wanna I think the poor getting to be rich, the poor girl getting to be rich is, is like the fantasy for sure. And there's so many different tropes that play on that. Like the fake identity where she gets to go and be the princess for a little while. Oh, sorry. Or where she gets to be like in a fake relationship with the billionaire who, you know, they're like all those different tropes. If you build into it, a poor girl getting to step into this world of rich luxury is satisfying a universal fantasy. And there's so many different ways you can do that. Mm hmm. Perfect. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this month of talking about kiss scenes, how to write good kiss scenes, and then how to write good tropes. Um, my biggest advice is to read other books and study them. Don't don't write down exactly word for word, but if you're reading a lot of rom-coms, write down what you consistently see coming up, situations that she's in, things that happen to her. I have a friend who, when she did that, she decided she was going to write, like, she was going to read all the books that were selling well in this genre. She wrote down everything that, that readers' expectations for those tropes inside of the book. And she wrote the book. She made 80 grand that, like, one month. So it's wow. very, very important to study That's these amazing. types of things and hit those readers' expectations so that you, it becomes easier for you to sell your book, easier to pitch your book. If you don't want to do self publishing, you want to do traditional publishing. Being able to tell the person right away what the book is about without having to tell them anything else is such a it's, it's a very hard skill to learn. But if you put the mm -hmm. steps or the building blocks there at first, mm -hmm. then it's easier when you have to turn around and then sell it to somebody wherever they are. So we hope this was helpful. Join us next month where Laura is going to be hosting. We are going to talk about rom-com, which is very exciting. And to if you have if you write rom-com or interested in rom-com, make sure you join our Facebook rom-com group, No Drama Llama Rom-com <laughs> Author Group, um, and where we're going to be talking more about their stuff there. So thank you so much, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.